Well, uh, first and foremost, congratulations for getting through the traffic tonight, uh, which I have, I have never seen as bad in Madison, but uh, that is as it is. I never saw traffic that good. Yeah, I know. It's just, <laughs> I just want to tell you, Jamie Raskin is in the midst of a Madison love fest. He, is, he keeps raving about the lakes and the, the buildings and the people and the whole bit. And, and I think it's important before we get going into the really serious stuff here to note that Jamie is, by blood relation, a badger. <laughs> His, well, the, my dad grew up in Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, and uh, both of my sisters went to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, my younger sister, Eden, graduated. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> The, the other one, I couldn't take the cold after a couple of years and I went back east. And, um, but yeah, I'm very moved and inspired to be here. And I've got uh, cousins I'm going to see all over the state, including my cousins, Patty and Barry, who started the Mustard Museum. Indeed. So, yes, indeed. Yeah. And they're here. And Barry, I don't know where Barry is right now, He's but here someplace. Barry's also a professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School where he teaches about food law. And I will and say, mustard law. Mustard law. Yeah. yeah. And I and I will say that that uh, that we actually had a really very uh, much much more kind of formal introduction, uh, but we've already gotten into Wisconsinisms, yeah. which is a, a a tragic reality of our state that we cannot avoid. But uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. I know people are still straggling in because of the traffic stuff, but we are going to begin uh, because we've got a lot to talk about. And uh, I will tell you that, that right off the bat, uh, you are in the company of a, of, of a pretty remarkable figure. Because in August of this year, the state of Texas banned Jamie Raskin's <laughs> book on... <laughs> Not the book you have all bought, but... <laughs> The book that he wrote many years ago on student rights, he is one of the greatest experts in the country and the world on the rights of students to exercise free speech and freedom of the press. He wrote a book called We the Students uh, a number of years ago, and it was banned in August by the state of Texas. Um, and you thought that's a pretty big deal, right, to get banned by Texas. <laughs> but the next day, Vladimir Putin banned Jamie Raskin for life from Russia. <laughs> yeah. But, but I'm making it in Madison. He's, it so, seems yeah. to be coming. Yeah, so, so finally, yeah. you found refuge in Madison. Yeah. And uh, I want to start out with Jamie Raskin and I have known each other for quite a long time. And we have a, many shared passions, some of them related to the Constitution. Uh, but perhaps our deepest shared passion is for Tom Paine. And, uh, and so I want to actually read the, the line from Tom Paine that all of you already know, uh, his, probably his most famous uh, words. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our winter soldier in the struggle for democracy and constitutional liberty in this country, Jamie Raskin. Th thank you very much, John. That, that means a lot to me. That is one of my favorite passages, um, but under strict instructions from Speaker Pelosi, we've updated the language so it doesn't offend modern sensibilities. Now it is, these are the times that try men and women's souls. Well, as a matter so, of fact, yeah, so. as a matter of fact, I was just gonna mention that. <laughs> oh, you were, yeah. You. <laughs> um, and good for the speaker. Um, I, I thought and Payne was a feminist who was fighting for women's suffrage from the beginning. In and fact, an abolitionist. In fact, we, should, we, we are going to have to inform you that tonight we're going to talk about nothing but Tom Paine. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, we're going to do a little better than that. Can I say something about Tom Paine before we leave the topic? Let us um, begin. I, if you've come to Washington, and I hope you have, um, 
there's no statue of Tom Paine. So I introduced a bill um, right when I got in, and now um, it has been unanimously and enthusiastically recommended by the uh, Historical Review Commission to Congress. And so uh, it's passed out of the subcommittee, it's going to committee, and um, who knows, uh, maybe the next time you come to Washington, you'll be able to come see the statue of the great Tom Paine, uh, who wrote Common Sense in the Age of Reason and said you can't have one without the other. So, yeah. so I thought that was actually a place we might begin tonight because uh, you are a Paine scholar, uh, and a, I know you're modest about these things, mm. but uh, often look to try to update what he had to say for the modern era. What would Thomas Paine think about the moment that America is in today? <clears throat> well, I mean, he would recognize it in the sense that um, we're on the cusp of something great uh, in terms of the possibility of democratic breakthrough. I mean, we have overthrown the, the superstitions and the bigotries and the hatreds of the 20th century, and what's going on now is the last gasp of authoritarianism and racism and anti-Semitism and you know, all of the, the ghosts of the 20th century. Um, but when we get through that, um, we've got the opportunity to create, you know, a democratic civilization in America and all over the world that honors and respects every single person. Um, and then we've got to just unify everybody to uh, deal with the civilizational crisis of climate change. Um, so he would recognize, like, you know, one of his big fans, Frederick Douglass, that, um, you know, it's a time of struggle, and people need to struggle to get through this period, but we're going to end up all right. And I think he would also recognize that uh, the vast majority of Americans are on the side of democratic institutions and democratic values. He would see that clearly, and... Um, <clears throat> You know, he would he would know what you know what I know just <clears throat> from my travels uh, this summer to a bunch of different districts and states and stuff. We are not a racist country. We are not a misogynistic country. Uh, we are not a country that uh, you know meets people by grabbing their genitals, uh, and we're not a, a country of kleptocrats and tyrants and bullies. Uh, and autocrats. We are the world's greatest multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious constitutional democracy, even having to deal with Donald Trump and all those people. That's who we are. And he would see it, and he would know it. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let us, I want to try and cover a lot of territory tonight in a relatively short amount of time. And I thought it might be best to begin with the news and to begin with kind of the, the activities that you are most known for at this moment and most engaged with, and that is obviously the January 6th committee and activities related to uh, Donald Trump. So let's start by, with the basics. Uh, how much trouble is Donald Trump in? Well, <clears throat> um, I think there are very few people on earth who could wake up and handle all of the legal troubles he's brought upon himself. Um, <clears throat> you know, when it came out about the fact that he'd been pilfering thousands of government documents, many of them classified top secret documents and leaving them around this public hotel, uh, which is a, a famous uh, magnet for foreign spies and uh, people from other, you know, countries and so on. Um, when we heard that, all of us on the January 6th committee were completely shocked because that's a completely different crime. That has nothing to do with what we've been investigating, which was, of course, uh, his um, determined efforts to overthrow the 2020 presidential election by trying to coerce the state legislatures to nullify 
the popular vote and install electors just for Trump. And when that didn't work, going to the election officials like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and saying, just find me 11,781 votes. That's all I want. That's all I want. I'm a politician. Just give me 11,781 votes. Uh, and, um, you know, and when that didn't work, well, there was the Michael Flynn plan uh, just to get the Department of Defense, get the Army to seize the election machines all over the country and rerun the election at the direction of the president, because all of you know that provision in the Constitution, which allows the president to do that. Um, and when that didn't work, then it all came down, you know, to, to January 6th and the attempt to, you know, get Pence to step outside of his constitutional role and, um, you know, just to declare unilateral extra constitutional powers to nullify electoral college votes, to kick the whole thing into the House of Representatives for a contingent election where they knew they would win, even though the Democrats control the House because we don't vote on the basis of one member, one vote in a 12th Amendment contingent election. We vote on the basis of one state, one vote, and they had 27 states. We have 22. Pennsylvania split nine to nine would have just been completely disregarded. But that was kind of the plan that they were trying to execute. So anyway, that's, that was the particular crime we've been on. And then, you know, he, there was this other crime of stealing. But I mean, the guy is a one-man crime wave. You know, he wakes up and uh, every day, I mean, is it real estate fraud? Is it bank fraud? Uh, is it collecting millions of dollars illegally from foreign governments or taking money from the U.S. government? I mean, this, you know, I fault... It, it, in my book, John, I fault us, the Democrats, for this. Um, he should have been impeached. Should have been impeached early on. We're going to get to that. All right. Well, <laughs> we're getting to that. So, yeah. <laughs> mm. um, so, so, we've established he's in a bit of trouble, and, uh, uh, and enough trouble for a normal person to say, okay. Let's make a deal or something. Or maybe say something like, I'm not going to run for president again. Yeah. Uh, I think ultimately what he's counting on is that nobody can figure out what it would mean to send a former president to prison with Secret Service guards with him in prison. Uh, and, you know, unless the Secret Service guards are sentenced themselves and they can be in the neighboring cell. It's getting very know? complicated Yeah, here. that's a little so, complicated. So let's, let's make it less complicated. Yeah. And... Um, you sit on the January 6th committee. You took the summer off, and so we, then we had the Mar-a-Lago stolen documents scandal to entertain us there. Now we come back into the fall and did the January 6th committee, which obviously didn't really take the summer off. It was doing a lot of work. Yeah. Um, what's the trajectory going forward? We know the committee did a tremendous amount of work, had you know, incredible hearings, which really did shape a lot of thinking. But now you come into this critical next stage. Well, the, the way I see it um, is that to complete the narrative, we have two things to do. And I'm speaking here just as one member. Um, but we need to tie up some loose ends, like what happened to those thousands of mysteriously disappeared Secret Service uh, texts and Department of Defense texts. Um, was that just an accident or was that a cover up? Who knows? Um, but we've got to try to figure that out. And there are other things, like what exactly Donald Trump had planned when he wanted to follow his armed mob up to the Capitol to enter, uh, like Mussolini, presumably. Um, you know, what was, the, what was the plan there, um, specifically? There are certainly some members of Congress who know what the plan was. But um, anyway, so there's some loose ends, but the basic elements of the story are now known by the people of the United States of America. And we have that right because this is a democracy and we have the right to know what's going on with our own government. And so I do consider that a big success of our committee, that people understand what happened. Um, but Well, and Carl Bernstein, who knows a little bit about investigating presidents, uh, said last night that this, this committee's work was spectacular, that it was a, this was an epic accomplishment, what has already been done. Well, I However, appreciate that, but the other part of it, yes. it you know, under House Resolution 503, we are to assess the events and report on the events of January 6th to the country, to the Congress, determine the cause as best that we can, and then 
make legislative recommendations going forward on how to fortify American democratic institutions against coups, insurrections, political violence, uh, and electoral sabotage. And that is just as important as what we've done. Obviously, people have been engrossed by the details of the story. I can't believe you know, people come up to me and they know dozens of names of people who were involved at all kinds of levels. Cassidy Hutchinson, everybody, you know, has thoughts on her. Somebody said to me earlier today in Wisconsin, well, you guys have really overlooked Michael Flynn's brother in the Department of Defense. You got to get back to him. So, you know, so we, we, we but we've got to do that. But then we really need to um, guarantee the right to vote in America and guarantee that the will of the people is vindicated in every election at every level. So I want to unpack this just a little bit. Uh, when you're tying up the strings or the threads, does the, Gen the name Jenny Thomas come up at all? <laughs> you know, we've talked to more than 1,000 people. Um, and um, you know, they almost knocked over the U.S. government. I mean, we almost lost it all on January 6th. So there were literally thousands of people involved in this. Um, and um, it's not clear to me as one member whether she was a major player. This is Jenny Thomas, the wife of uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Yeah. Who was very active in, and, and who uh, we in Wisconsin know encouraged uh, folks here to, to come up with a list of fake electors. Yeah. Apparently did. Yeah, and and uh, Ron Johnson played his cameo role in that particular, <laughs> but execution. only only for a few seconds. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously we're not going to be able to have a thousand witnesses come before the American public. So we're trying to bring people forward who are telling the truth and have the most important information to convey. Um, and um, so I've not yet seen testimony from Ginny Thomas that would suggest to me that it's warranted to give her a, a national platform at this point. Again, just speaking as one member of the committee, but um, you know, her particular involvement raises profound questions about the Supreme Court and her husband and so on but those are not really within the jurisdictional purview of uh, our investigation. But I think there's some other committees that may be very interested, including the Judiciary Committee and the Oversight Committee. Um, so th there's a, you know, this is not the end of our examination of um, a whole political subculture which is determined to govern despite the fact that they are in a minority and a shrinking minority. And you know, John, let me just say, this is the way I see the struggle in America today, that um, the, the vast majority of the people are on the side of democratic practices and values and institutions, and yet Trump's cult, which used to be Abraham Lincoln's great party, and it's now a cult of authoritarian personality of one guy, that cult represents a small minority of the country, um, and they hang on only through manipulation of a lot of anti-democratic devices like voter suppression statutes, the gerrymandering of our state and federal districts so that political minorities in states control the state legislatures mm -hmm. in the state, something you guys know something about. A little bit. Uh, uh, and the use of the filibuster, a profoundly anti-democratic instrument, which is not in the Constitution, which is not in federal law, it's just a rule of the Senate, already riddled with exceptions for everything from the Budget Reconciliation Act to the Trade Adjustment Act to judicial nominations. Certainly, we should find a place to carve out an exception to the filibuster for democracy and voting rights. What do you think? Um, and so, um, Basically, it's a race between the will of the people to move forward on everything from voting rights itself and democratic institutions and gun safety uh, and climate change versus the will of a minority and the means of a minority to block us from making action. But, you know, I'm with John Dewey who said the only solution to the ills of democracy is more democracy. And that's what America needs right now. We've got to clear away all the underbrush of all of that stuff. 
So the committee actually, this gets into the recommendations that the committee makes, because the committee could uh, say, you know, an awful lot of what happened on January 6th seemed to revolve around the Electoral College, which was created by a lot of people who were not particularly small D Democrats. Maybe we should get rid of the Electoral College. The committee could say that. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it would be very consistent with our entire constitutional development since the beginning of the Republic. I mean, if you read the Constitution the way that I do, the, the 17 amendments that we've adopted since the original Bill of Rights are overwhelmingly pro-democracy, suffrage-expanding amendments that deepen the meanings of political equality. Uh, and freedom in the country. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment declares equal protection and due process. The 15th Amendment banned race discrimination in voting. The 17th Amendment shifted the mode of election of the U.S. Senators from the legislatures, the bribe-soaked legislatures, to the people. The 19th Amendment gave us woman suffrage, doubling the electorate in the country. The 23rd Amendment gave people in Washington, D.C. the right to participate in presidential elections, at least. The 24th Amendment uh, abolished poll taxes in federal elections, and the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. So our whole constitutional development over our history has been to open up democracy and getting rid of those original anti-democratic filtering devices. And I think getting rid of the Electoral College is indicated at this moment. So I'm totally with you on that. Um, and, you know, the polls show 75 or 80 percent of the people say we should elect the president the same way we elect governors and U.S. senators and representatives and mayors. Whoever gets the most votes wins, basically, you know. Yeah, and yeah. so um, I don't, you know, our committee has, has worked very hard to operate based on consensus. And, you know, we have, you know, some members from smaller states who are still laboring under the mythology that the Electoral College helps a smaller state, like Wyoming. It doesn't. Wyoming is ignored in presidential elections as a red state, and most red states are ignored in the presidential elections. Like most blue states, it's only the handful of swing states like Pennsylvania or Ohio or Florida, everybody can name them, that uh, actually attract the investment of candidate energy and time and campaign resources, and even TV ads. I mean, but if you're in a very blue state like California or New York or whatever, the candidates don't go there. If you're in a very red state like Mississippi or Alabama or Alaska or whatever, they don't go there, although I should say Alaska turning blue with the great Mary Peltola. So maybe, we'll see. But anyway, the point is, under the presidential elections, um, our, you know, every vote of every citizen should count and should count equally. And we shouldn't, you know, we spend millions and millions of dollars every year trying to export American electoral democracy to other countries that are writing constitutions and developing their practices. The one thing they never come back and say to us is, you know, one really ingenious thing you guys have that we want to do is this electoral college thing. Will you help us import that to our country? You know, we don't see that. We can learn from the rest of the world, and we can learn from our own elections. So I do think it's time for us to get through that, and I hope that this would be a moment when we can recognize not just the undemocratic nature of the electoral college, which has given us five popular vote losers as president in our history twice in this century in 2000 and 2016, and not only leaves out the vast majority of the public in the general election, but it also has proven now to be a danger to us. I mean, the old days, the first Wednesday of the first week of January after presidential election was a day, the guy who sits next to me in the Rules Committee, Eddie Perlmutter from Colorado, said it was a day of like drunken bipartisan celebration. The bars would you know, open up and everybody, it would take 10 minutes and everybody. Today, you can get killed on January the 6th because if you've got a strategic bad faith actor who wants to poison every nook and cranny in this archaic institution, they can do it. And that's what happened to us. So somewhere in the midst of that answer, which I loved, uh, 
was a suggestion that the committee may, may wrestle with the issue a little, but it may not, it may not necessarily get there. Um, let me ask you about one other thing on the committee before we go into a few other areas I want to talk about. Um, it, and you did mention this bad faith actor. Um, is there any chance that this committee will recommend that Donald Trump be indicted and tried uh, for a seditious conspiracy or some other crime? Well, here's the thing. I mean, there was a period of like intense media interest in that question. You know, were we going to make criminal referrals? Um, there is no legal mechanism, no statute for Congress to make legal referrals for basic crimes to the Department of Justice. Recognizing that, but still, yeah. the fact that you got this you've a group of people, relatively intelligent, who spent quite a bit of time looking at this, yeah. you could certainly express an opinion about... No, no, I, and I agree, but I just want to explain how people got confused about that, because there is a statute that allows us to make referrals for criminal contempt. And there were a number of people, Steve Bannon being one of them, who just blew us off. And, you know, note to the moms and dads of America, if your kid gets a subpoena to go to court, don't do what Steve Bannon did and just blow it off. I mean, if you think you've got some kind of defense, go in and explain it. And you've got the right to raise your defense to, uh, if you think you've got some kind of immunity, like a Fifth Amendment privilege, whatever. But you can't just stay home watching TV, you know. So, th so then the... the press got the idea, oh, they're referring people for crimes. But there is a very specific statutory mechanism for that. You know, the other thing, we're just trying to get it out there. And we did in the hearings, and we've done it in a number of legal filings, and we'll do it again in our report. But um, obviously, the Department of Justice doesn't need a legal referral from me or any other member of Congress or anybody in this room, although all of us can drop a dime on Donald Trump uh, but they're not going to be surprised by anything you're telling them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're not going to run away from that, and we might have some kind of compilation, if we have room in the report, of the crimes that we've encountered along the way. You know, so, yeah. That would so be a very, there'd be a long uh, addendum there. Yes. It? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a possibility, that, that it, somewhere in this report there might be at least some reference to the crimes and to... Um, yeah, potential. You know there have been more than 900 prosecutions brought already by the Department of Justice in the most sweeping yeah. criminal investigation in its history, including a number of prosecutions and convictions for seditious conspiracy, conspiracy mm -hmm. to overthrow the government. So that is very much out there. Oh, and by the way, just if you don't mind me throwing in one more little tangent on this. I think that's why we're here. Yeah, so there have been more than 900 of these indictments and prosecutions. Not a single charge has been thrown out of court on the basis that the Second Amendment gives you the right to overthrow the government or commit insurrection, which is what I hear on a daily basis from Republican members of Congress, that the purpose of the Second Amendment is, allow you to, is to allow you to raise arms against the government. I don't think so. Um, there are more than a half a dozen different places in the Constitution that specifically forbid insurrection, treason, and rebellion against the government, including, by the way, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says if you've sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, which you betray, you can never hold federal or state office again. Okay? Um, and just to give you like another example, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 says that the Congress has the power to call forth the militia to suppress insurrections in the states. And my GOP colleagues think the militia is the people organized against the government to commit coups and insurrections. It's not. The Constitution specifically contemplates that the role of the militia is for the government to put down people like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers who would try to overthrow the democratic will of all the people. One last thing on this, and then we, we pivot. Uh, you did mention the word coup. Chairman Thompson referred to this as a coup attempt. Do you agree that, that what happened on January 6th it, was a coup attempt, or what, what do we call it? That was part of it. I mean, the, the, way, the way I think of it is there were three rings of seditious activity. And um, the least dangerous was actually the, the outer ring of the mob. 
because there were tens of thousands of people. A lot of them undoubtedly came armed, ready to beat the hell out of cops and storm the Capitol. And they'd gotten the word from the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and the Aryan Nations and the militia groups and so on. But there were also a lot of people in there who just got a text from the President of the United States saying they're trying to steal the election, stop the steal, come to Washington. And they did. So there was a mixture there. I mean, there were people on January 7th calling Nancy Pelosi's office saying, do you guys have a lost and found? Because I think I left my phone there yesterday. I think I left my wallet. I mean, they, they thought it was like a Civil War battle reenactment or something. Um, okay, then there was a middle ring of insurrectionists. I call it the ring of the insurrection. And these were the organized domestic violent extremist groups, perhaps a couple thousand people who were brought in for the most massive display of white nationalist power, um, certainly ever seen in our lifetimes. Um, and they had been engaged in a lot of traffic online, talking about how they were going to storm the Capitol um, and commit violence. And um, these were the people who assaulted our officers. More than 150 officers ended up with broken arms, broken legs, jaws, missing fingers, strokes, heart attacks, concussions, contusions, traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, I have constituents in my district in Maryland, which borders Washington, D.C., beautiful District 8, who are still um, in both physical and mental therapy trying to recover from the wounds um, inflicted on that day. And they came in with the idea of storming the Capitol, driving the House and the Senate out of our chambers, which they did. Um, hanging Mike Pence for not participating in the plot to overthrow the election, um, looking for Nancy Pelosi in uh, you know, a kidnap or assassination search party, um, and es essentially overturning our form of government. This was not the scariest ring. The scariest ring was the ring of the coup. Now, and that's an odd word to use in our political parlance because we don't have a lot of experience with coups in our own country. Um, and we think of a coup as something that the military conducts against a president. But the political scientists also describe another kind of coup, um, which is called a self-coup, where a president fearing electoral defeat decides to overthrow the election and the constitutional order. And that's what we were up against a president who was engaged in a coup, surrounded by a violent insurrection, surrounded by crazy mob violence. Um, and that was uh, the American carnage that Donald Trump had anticipated in his glorious uh, inauguration speech back in 2017. Three years ago, in uh, December of 2019, I went to your office one afternoon, and we spent pretty much the whole afternoon there uh, talking about the Constitution and anticipating the first impeachment of Donald Trump. He is the one president we could talk about the first impeachment as opposed to the second. And as that was before COVID, it, it seems like ancient history now to talk about, but the conversation that we had, uh, two things were striking. I think people have noticed it tonight. Uh, Jamie Raskin can actually quote the Constitution from beginning to end. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's, it's in his head and heart. Um, they, they're clapping for me being a nerd. I well, like you that, are so a nerd. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. uh, mm -hmm. and, and you are on a university campus. There's some honor for that. Yeah, right. and, uh, but also that, that uh, the, the striking thing about, about Jamie Raskin is that, that he can quote the Constitution from beginning to end and talk about it in, in a very deep way. But he also thinks about it in the modern context, about how to apply it to today and to try and resolve the challenges that were left unresolved at the founding. And I remember three years ago how, I think it's not unfair to say optimistic you were, that in anticipating the first impeachment of Donald Trump, not necessarily thinking that it would be seen out, that the Senate would do the right thing, blah, 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 but, but anticipating that this was going to be a moment where we would really open up a discussion about the Constitution and begin to understand its core elements, and above all, that the, the House and the Senate, the Congress, 
is the first body, the first reality of that Constitution, and to assert that the Congress has the power to hold a president to account. Right. And I'm wondering if you think now, three years on, uh, what do you think about that? Have we, how well have we done on that? Where do we stand as a country on asserting those basic premises of the Constitution? And really, at, at, at a core level, on asserting the Constitution itself as a set of rules that we actually respect and follow? Well, it's too early to tell because we're still in the middle of the fight. Yeah. I mean, we're literally still in the middle of it, and nobody knows exactly how it's going to turn out, but uh, I know that we have huge, huge numbers of people in America who are tremendously engaged with everything that's going on uh, at the most detailed level and are acting as proper citizens of a democracy. And uh, I will say about you know, my political party that with all of its flaws and imperfections, and you guys don't need to lecture me about how we don't know how to message. I've gotten the, I've gotten the message on the message. Um, but even with all of our flaws, um, we are a much tougher party today than we were before we started dealing with Donald Trump. And we are absolutely determined to defend democracy and keep democracy going. I mean, the mistake is to think that democracy is a static thing. It's not, it's a dynamic process. And Tocqueville said in Democracy in America that democracy and voting rights in our country are either shrinking and shriveling away or they're growing and expanding. And that's why um, the, the opposite of the voter suppression and the gerrymandering and all of that stuff is not doing nothing and just defending the status quo. The opposite is we've got 713,000 taxpaying, draftable citizens in Washington, D.C. who are the only residents of a national capital on earth who are not represented in their own legislature. It's time for statehood for Washington, D.C. And it's time for statehood for three and a half million Americans in Puerto Rico uh, who learned the bitter price of colonial disenfranchisement during Hurricane Maria when they got cheated out of hundreds of millions of dollars in FEMA aid by Donald Trump and he threw a bunch of paper towels at them. Um, and it is time for us to put into the Constitution what was not there when it began because Tom Paine didn't write it, but we need a constitutional guarantee for every citizen of the United States to vote at every level of government over them. Uh, we need to have it because what we have, John, you know, is a series of anti-discrimination amendments like the 15th and the 19th and, you know, the 24th. You can't discriminate based on race or sex or poll tax, but you know what? We got millions of people who can't vote because they went to prison, they served good time, but they still live in the seven or eight states that are still disenfranchising people for life, even after they've gotten every other right restored to them. So we've got to take the right to vote seriously, um, and we need to secure the whole structure of the right to vote, because that's the other thing we're dealing with now, which is that in uh, you know a lot of the red states, they are trying to pass laws that will give kind of uh, um, administrative bodies appointed directly by the legislature or the governor power over the vote to recount the vote or retabulate the vote. Um, that's a really dangerous thing um, as they try to take us further and further away from a real popular democracy, and we've got to be moving in the other direction. Hey, one of the elements of the Constitution, obviously, is that impeachment power, and you've certainly been engaged with it. Uh, uh, after the first impeachment of Donald Trump, he was impeached, uh, he was not removed. Uh, did you, at that point, anticipate in any sense that there could actually end up being a second impeachment? Or did you think, like Susan yeah, Collins, that he well, might learn his lesson? I, I thought, and you know this, John, I think I maybe even wrote something about the Nation, mag for the Nation Magazine about this. Um, look, what, what was the real cardinal sin of the, the Trump administration? Um, the Ukraine shakedown um, was his looking forward to the election and wanting to get some dirt on Joe Biden. He wanted a foreign leader to just, just come out and say you're investigating him and just you know 
smear Joe Biden, and then I'll release the money to you that you need to defend your country against my buddy Vladimir Putin. Um, and so, but that was complex, right? I think that what was the original sin and why is he so determined to get back into office? Because it was a money-making operation from the very beginning. And he took millions and millions of dollars from foreign governments. And you know what he, he said when we raised these just naked emoluments clause violations, he said, well, it's okay because I'm not taking my salary of $400,000. Your salary as president is the only thing you're allowed to take, okay? You're not allowed to take money from China and Russia and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and all of the places that are finding uh, ways to spend millions of dollars at your hotels and golf clubs and engaged in franchise deals and so on. And I do fault our side for not educating the public about that. And, you know, people thought, well, it's just too complicated. People aren't going to understand it because emoluments is a complicated word. It's not that complicated, emolument. Four syllables. That's not, it's not that complicated. Emolument is just a payment. Um, and uh, I even um, had legislation to turn the name of the Trump National Hotel in Washington into the Washington Emolument. Uh, <laughs> and it could be a stop on the tour buses. Um, because that's where they were depositing all of their bribes, you know. So I, I think that that was a mistake because I think that the country fundamentally understands the character type we have in Donald Trump. He's an old American uh, character. He's a hustler. He's a charlatan. He's a con man. That's what he is. And um, fine, you want to do that? Go do it on your own time. That's not what the presidency is for. That's not what the government is for. The government is, has got to be an instrument of the common good in the public interest and not private self-enrichment. And the guy had more than 150 businesses and he came in and he's asked on you know, his first or second day in office, are you going to divest yourself and stop being a businessman? He said, no, I'm gonna keep it going, but I'm gonna turn over some of the day-to-day -day management to the kids. But he obviously was still in business and it was a money-making enterprise from the beginning. And even the campaign financing is a money-making enterprise for people in, um, the Trump milieu. So we've got to go back to the idea of separating private profit making from public service. You know, America's a great country. You can go out and make a lot of money if that's what you want to do, or you can go into public service and do that. And that's another reason, by the way, that we really should pass a ban on members of Congress and anybody else in government <laughs> trading individual stocks. I mean, it's not the New York Stock Exchange. So. Hey. So it's fair to say that the failure of the first impeachment, it, successful impeachment for failure to remove, and failure in some ways maybe to communicate the wholeness of it, was it, in a way an original sin because it, it meant that we were going we to end up dealing with, with this issue. We thought as a country that, that we would deal with it with an election. Um, Donald Trump was defeated by 7 million votes. Uh, 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. You were noting college. the Electoral College, and, yeah. and I'll also note that uh, you are associated with the state of Wisconsin, which did flip and did all sorts of things there that, to help along the process. But obviously Trump, after, after the election, was resisting these results and all, all the things that we'll talk about in, in just a second. This becomes where your, your book, Unthinkable, which is an incredible book, uh, and one that I think many people have copies of. And, and, uh, but in your book, Unthinkable, you talk about this period. And, and one of the realities was that your son, Tommy, um, who wrote for The Nation magazine, as you did and as his grandfather, Marcus, did, um, and he was a remarkable young man with deep commitment uh, to animal rights and so many issues, Tommy committed suicide at the end of 2000. And um, you were clearly in mourning and, and uh, in this very difficult position. And then suddenly, as the great constitutional expert of the Congress, uh, you were forced to uh, step into the crisis of January 6th. And I, I know it's hard, but I... I appreciate it to the extent that you would like to reflect a bit on, on that 
that incredible moment in your life and how you, how you came through it. Hmm. Um, well, um, I mean, Tommy was a beautiful, extraordinary young man. Uh, he was a playwright, a poet. Um, he was a second year student at Harvard Law School when we lost him. Um, and um, he was a great champion of human rights, a great champion of animal rights and welfare. And um, he um, fought depression ever since he was in college. Um, and, um, you know, and for those of you who've had someone in your family deal with it, you know what, you know what that means. Um, and uh, the COVID-19 period, I think, just enveloped his, his friends, his generation, the country in a lot of darkness. Um, and um, so it was tough enough for everybody, but for people battling a mental illness, it became a, a really excruciating period. And we lost him on the last day of 2020, um, plunging me into a kind of darkness I'd never known before and just creating, you know, an emotional catastrophe for our family. Um, and, um, and it was exactly a week after we lost Tommy, the day after we buried him, that the, um, the insurrection took place on January 6th. And uh, Tabitha, our youngest daughter, had come with me um, to the Capitol. Um, I thought that she needed me. She thought that I needed her. Uh, I guess we were both right. But also Hank, who is my son-in-law, married to our oldest daughter, Hannah. Um, and they had eloped in the summer of 2020 in uh, one of those COVID-19 Elvis Presley marriages in uh, a wedding in, in Nevada. Uh, uh, that's a different story, totally. But anyway, I, he came too. So the, and there were very, very few young people there. Um, because we were told not to bring our families, but you know, um, the speaker had made an exception, and Steny Hoyer let me use his office right off of the house floor um, for family. And um, so, anyway, yeah, I don't think I want to go through all the details right now. But they, but they were they were trapped. They were caught for a couple of hours um, when we were um, evacuated and shepherded out when the mob broke in and began to barrel, try to barrel into the House of Representatives. And um, yeah, it was, that's as close to fascism as I ever want to come or want, want my family to come or my country to come to. And that's why I am determined to get through this whole thing. And, and, <laughs> yeah. So, and John, I should say, you know, when the speaker asked me to, to lead the impeachment team, I mean, I was startled and baffled and, you know, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping and I was, you know, but something just told me immediately I had to do it and that I felt Tommy right in my chest and in my heart and I felt like it's something that would make him proud and something that he would want me to do. And I, I didn't really experience it as much of a choice. You know, I felt like I just had to do it. Yeah. So. I think a lot of Americans were amazed by your strength in that moment and, um, and by what you were able to bring to that impeachment trial. And it is striking to me that, that, I know we talk about the success and failures of impeachments, but it seems to me that, that your great struggle in leading, the, leading the, the team that tried Donald Trump was to get 
some portion of the Republican Party to, to come with Democrats and to recognize what was at stake. And I will hold to the view, I wrote it at the time, that getting 57 senators, which was the largest number ever to vote for an impeachment, was a remarkable accomplishment. And at least that was how I saw it. I don't know if you see it that way, or how, did, how do you see what, what you did? There? Well, today I do see it that way because I'm able to take a broader historical view. I mean, there have been four presidential impeachment trials in the Senate in our history. One was Andrew Johnson. Uh, one was Bill Clinton for doing you know what. Uh, uh, one was Trump won the Ukraine shakedown and then, and then ours, and it was the most sweeping bipartisan result in our history, but we fell 10 votes short of the 67 vote, two thirds requirement for conviction. So uh, Trump beat the constitutional spread, as the uh, bookies would say. Uh, so, um, but, and so at the, at the time I was really kind of crestfallen about it, John, because you know the evidence was so overwhelming and irrefutable and certainly unrefuted I don't know if you saw the presentation by Trump's lawyers, uh, but, um, but, but- It was entertaining in its own way. Yeah, um, but, but the, the, the case was so overwhelming and our team, I mean, Stacey Plaskett and Joe Neguse and Joaquin Castro and Eric Swallow, I mean, it's just amazing presentations. These people were working 24 seven to make this happen. Diana Deguette, I mean, it was just an extraordinary team uh, my friend Madeline Dean from Pennsylvania. I mean, just amazing, remarkable Ted Lieu um, performance. And, you know, we, of course, didn't do an independent investigation. So we had none of the evidence that we've gotten in the January 6th committee, but we were pursuing one count, one charge, which was incitement to insurrection against the union. And so we, we were doing it completely based on the public record of Trump's activities and his statements and his solicitation and exhortation of the mob, including during the riot itself, where he doubled down and you know said after two o'clock that Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what needed to be done. When he knew that Mike Pence was in danger and we were all fleeing, he continued to inflame the mob. So anyway, it was so overwhelming. I thought we would have a hundred to zero result. I really did, which was in retrospect, just you know, a, a little bit deranged because a number of the Republicans had come out and said they were voting to acquit and, and they were organizing to acquit. But I thought to myself, the evidence is so overwhelming. They have an oath of office to uphold and defend the Constitution against enemies, foreign and domestic. They swear another oath as jurors to render impartial justice, impartial meaning nonpartisan justice. And this was their opportunity not just to save the republic in the country, but the Republican Party. And I told them that they had to do it for their party in addition to everything else because he would bring the GOP to ruin. And I think that he will. The party that Lincoln created as an anti-racist, anti-slavery party, anti-know-nothing party, he hated the immigrant bashing um, and you know the trashing of people's ambitions to come to America, all of it, that party has been turned into just a nest of uh, vipers and miscreants and misanthropes and racists and um, you know, but he maybe maybe Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger can save it. I hope they do. And if not, I hope we get another political party that emerges that's worthy of America. I really do. So. Yeah. Quick aside, did you ever think you'd be saying nice things about Liz Cheney? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, Liz Cheney and I are in the same class, so we entered at the same time. So we've been we've been friends ever since we got to Congress, and I I always liked her very much. You know, she's a lawyer, she's a mom of five kids. Um, you know, I think that we we share some similar values. I, you know, I always say, hey, if you've got conservative values, come on over to the Democratic Party because we want to conserve the land, the air, the water, the climate, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. I mean, they're a party of nihilists at this point. Um, but I, I think that she's got really decent values. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think she's evolving, but still, 
Um, you know, I told her I can't wait to start disagreeing again with her in public uh, because we have like some major policy differences and I would love to, you know, to have some big forums and debates in, you know, a venue like this where Liz and I could talk about what we have in common in terms of our constitutional patriotism and commitment to the democracy and where we differ and why she's wrong. <laughs> well, so we're, we're, we're winding down here, but I want to, we have a few questions from the crowd and, and in classic Wisconsin politeness, many of them are just saying how great you are. Um, and so I won't read those because your ego is plenty fine. Th those, are, those are my cousins. Those are my now, There are a few family cousins family. in the yeah. crowd, yeah. but yeah. I, I'm so, not kidding I'm about sure, it. It's yeah. like literally, you know, thank you for your enduring service and, and some lovely statements yeah. here. Uh, so much to you there. Um, but there is one question here that, that maybe is particularly relevant to what you just said. Uh, it says, Peter Navarro said on MSNBC, uh, that they, the Trump administration, had over 100 congressmen lined up to assist their Green Bay sweep yeah. uh, plan. Uh, it, well, it, what an insult to Green Bay. I know. Bay. We are yeah. I mean, like, and, you know, we have, da <laughs> we have David Marinus, uh, Lombardi's biographer in the crowd, who I, I, not only was I upset by the whole taking of the term Green Bay and putting it in that context, but why wasn't Marinus on TV every night explaining that Lombardi was a Democrat? Uh, yeah. Well, I always thought that a sweep was a legal play yeah, in football. Well, yeah. But the, but this is so. It, then the, the serious question: uh, Why have we not heard of this uh, this discussed on the January sixth? Well, no. The, the Green Bay yeah. sweep is is their um, term of endearment I for for the John Eastman yeah. theory, which was okay. Uh, well, let's get. Pence or a substitute that we can mm -hmm. impose mm -hmm. uh, if Pence won't do it. And you saw, interestingly, you know, Pence was driven out of the building. There's a picture of him leaving with the guy with the nuclear football in the briefcase right behind him. Um, but they, they were leaving the building and the Secret Service tried to get him to leave the Capitol campus. And he said, I'm not getting in that car. He said, I'm not leaving until we count the Electoral College votes. Mike Pence was a constitutional patriot mm -hmm. that day. He really was. But anyway, the Green Bay sweep was to either get him or a substitute to unilaterally reject Electoral College votes from Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, just vaporizing the votes of millions of people, and then either declare Trump the president on the floor or to refer it to the House of Representatives for the so-called contingent election, where they would run it like the Republican National Convention and just hoist the the state, you know, the state banners and say, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, uh, Alaska with, uh, you know, with Trump and and right down the line. And they thought now they would not have gotten Wyoming because I don't think there's any way Liz Cheney would have participated in that fraud. But even then, they would have had 26 votes to like 23 for us and you know one uh, Pennsylvania on the sidelines. So I think that's what the Green Bay sweep mm -hmm. was. But, you know, as I was saying, I mean, I'm a washed up football jock and uh, a sweep is a lawful play. What they were doing is not lawful in any way. Uh, that was. Uh, you know. But that that mm -hmm. should be investigated, right? If they're oh. suggesting that 100 members of Congress were prepared to participate in that, is it not appropriate that that that, that should be looked at in some context? Well, so we got to distinguish different things here. I mean, there were clearly, there were more than 100 uh, GOP members who voted to reject electoral college votes from um, Arizona, from Pennsylvania. Um, and that, of course, is their right. There's nothing unlawful about their doing that. I mean, it was ridiculous, but that was their right to do it. To the extent that there were members that were involved in either the insurrection or the political coup, the attempt to get Pence to step outside of his constitutional role and to impose um, this extra constitutional uh, regime on the country, then we would want to know about that. And we've subpoenaed a number of members uh, of the House who have not shown up and, you know, the committee uh, may or may not have something to say about that before it's all over. Let me ask you, as we finish up tonight, we talked a lot about your ties to Wisconsin. 
your father, Marcus Raskin, was born in Milwaukee uh, and a huge influence on you. Uh, he passed in 2017. And, and one of the people who really did warn about applying the rule of the law to the powerful. Yes. And, and clearly he had a huge influence on you. I mean, one of the things my dad wrote that's so beautiful that has stuck with me, I think I quoted an impeachment trial, was democracy needs a ground to stand on, and that ground is the truth. And if you don't have truth, then you can't have democracy because the people need to know what's going on in order to make decisions about their leaders, about policies, and so on. Um, so uh, my dad, like my son Tommy, uh, had very high hopes for what democracy could be and about the promotion of freedom for all people. And he believed so much in the civilizing movements of the last century and this century that have so transformed America. And, you know, I'm proud to be in politics as a, you know, in the mud practitioner of this art, such as it is, uh, whereas my dad was a philosopher, really, but he also tried to be engaged as much as possible, even, you know, with his philosophical disposition. But, um, you know, I hope that in some ways I'm helping to create a kind of world that my dad uh, envisioned and would be proud of because he wanted to see um, an America that was safe for the freedom and creativity of each person and the equality of everybody who lives here. And you and your Uncle Max was a, was a judge over Max Raskin, one of the great judges or jurists in Wisconsin, also the city attorney of Milwaukee. And so you've, you've got a lot of ties here to Wisconsin. I think, I think after- If the people of Maryland kick me out, I'm moving to you're Wisconsin. You're coming right back I'm here. Run, run for office yeah. here. So it's, There's some space for you. Yeah. I, think, I think that uh, your, your cousin-in-law even has, and we won't, we won't maybe do it until after we get done tonight when you're greet, meeting and greeting some folks, but uh, has, you're, you've got some sort of honors from the Mustard Museum coming your way. Uh, Is that right? Well, I gotta say, um, you know, these guys have made uh, mustards for all of my campaigns, which are by far the biggest hit in my campaign propaganda and uh, giveaways. So every, every time I, I bump into people in the street, they're like, when are we gonna get some more mustard from your Wisconsin cousins? So yeah, we, we gotta talk about that. So I think they made, they made an, they may have made an impeachment mustard for me. Uh, Barry, was there an impeachment yeah, mustard? I think it was there. There was indeed. Yeah. Yes, he, 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 there was impeachment it mustard. It was a little peach flavored yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. mustard. Yeah, yeah. And, impeachment. Which, which yeah. is a horrifying and, peach yet, and mint flavored, yet inspiring yeah. thought. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we started with Tom Payne. Let's finish off there. Uh, mm -hmm. Tom Payne said at a point when it appeared that the revolution had turned toward a successful path he, after the American crisis, he wrote, we have at present steered with safety through a rough sea and are bringing the ship into port. Let us take care she is not shipwrecked in the harbor. It strikes me that, that we're getting toward that place, right? This is, as you said at the start, this is a very difficult time because we haven't gotten to where we necessarily need to be as a country, but, but if we get the ship into the harbor without shipwrecking it, we may, we may get someplace good. And I'm wondering if, uh, as we close out tonight, you do think that, that we'll steer through the rough sea, that this country will in fact come out as, as a, a safe and sound and functional constitutional democracy uh, that really does uh, become again yeah. what pain wanted it to be. I mean, I don't think it, I know it. I know we're gonna get through it. And uh, you know, when, when I was growing up, my dad used to say to us, um, when everything looks hopeless, you are the hope. And um, I, I'm just seeing so many people around the country standing up now and not being afraid of, you know, of what we're facing. So, um, you know, we, we will get through Donald Trump and the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, we must do that quickly because we've got 
real serious challenges to deal with in terms of climate change and unifying the world around confronting the, you know, the ecological catastrophes uh, that await us. And I view them as underbrush and blowback from the last century, and we're gonna leave them behind, and we're gonna move forward, and we're gonna make a future that is um, befitting American democracy and humanity and the future that we want all of our children and grandchildren to have. Yeah. The Cap Times Idea Fest attendees, Madisonians, Wisconsinites, please, I know you just gave them applause, one more very, very loud round of applause <laughs> for the Tom Paine of our time, Congressman Jamie Raskin. <laughs>